Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, to the organizers for the invitation. This is very kind, allowing me to talk a little bit about our collaboration with Open Air. And I will show some results of that and specifically talking about how you can track reuse for FP7 funded publications and how this can maybe also serve um, as a starting point for discussion, how to collaborate on these things uh, in the future. Uh, just a few months ago, um, I was contacted by the Open Air Project um, and we discussed how to identify papers funded by the FP7 framework published in PLOS, which is, for those who don't know PLOS, is a, is a large uh, open access publisher focusing on medicine biology, and we specifically wanted to not just identify these publications, but also um, specifically match papers to uh, grant numbers, and then also, and I think that's quite new and hopefully interesting to you, also show the impact of these publications, not just list them, and of course, in the case of PLOS, everything is open access, but also try to show the impact that these publications have had so far. Um, and the, the first step really was to identify the publications and who has tried this as a publisher or as a, from a repository perspective, this is really hard. Um, PLOS doesn't have a field that authors fill in when they submit a paper which says, please give, you, give us your grant number and your funding agency. Um, so this is all free text. The only advantage we have is that because we're open access, we have a open search API so you can do a search specifically financial disclosures from all PLOS articles. And we had a very um, relaxed search strategy so we identified about two and a half thousand papers that not only had the words FP7 in there but a lot of combination with EU and European committee and so, so forth. And then the, the second step was really to match this to uh, to grants and to EU funding, and that was really mainly the work by Harry at the University of Athens. And without him, um, we wouldn't have found so many publications. In the end, and this is as of end of July, we found 1166 open access papers published by PLOS, funded by one of 624 um, FP7 projects. And um, it's, of course, very important to, to have a list of these papers and make this list available in, in different ways. But the next step, really, and this is what my job at PLOS is, is to really show what impact these papers are having. And this is a composite figure, just taking a few of the metrics we are collecting. So, for example, as of November 8, these 1166 papers have been accessed on the PLOS website, and it's, of course, not always you can read these papers about two million times. They have been downloaded close to uh, 500,000 times. They have been bookmarked in Mendeley, which is one of, one of the more popular reference managers. 14,000 times have been mentioned in Facebook, have been cited close to 5,000 times, and have also been mentioned on Wikipedia. And this is just a small list of things we can track. Um, and uh, the further analysis of this is, of course, much more work. So I will just show you data of one of the many projects that we found and the ENGAGE project, which is European Network for Genetic and Genomic Epidemiology, is the, the project that had the most papers published in PLOS. This is 30 publications. And here, for example, you see just the locations of first and last authors, just to get an idea that um, engages with a European consortium. The project lead is in Helsinki, so we're happy that there's at least one uh, first author in this set of papers. Of course, this is just the plus subset of engaged papers, not the papers by other publishers. Um, in the next slide, um, this is from these 30 papers from the engaged project. Over time, the total views on the PLOS website, which is both HTML views and PDF downloads. 
um, and the circle size is the number of citations. So obviously this very much depends on how old the article is, so that citations accumulate, uh, start to accumulate after about two years. Um, and the colors are the different PLOS journals. So orange is PLOS one, and green is PLOS biology and related journals. Um, so this is citations, but you can also look at other metrics. So this is Mendeley, a social bookmarking tool reference manager, and this looks similar, but you can also see that, of course, you don't have to wait two years, and you can also see one paper here in the middle, which has a fairly high number of uh, Mendeley bookmarks, and that's a methodology paper, how to do a micro error experiment, showing that reuse doesn't mean citation, but in some cases it's just something that a lot of people bookmark because they might need this method and without citing it in the, in the final paper. Um, you can then, of course, go into more detail. So I pick one of the highly cited papers. Uh, this one, for example, has been cited more than 100 times from the Engage project. You can see the downloads, the um, social network activity, Mendeley site you like, and other things. So for example, this paper has been linked to uh, from Wikipedia. So this is just a small article about a transcription factor, but uh, if somebody's interested in this transcription factor and wants to read more, um, he finds further down, not on the screen, further reading a link to this paper, and because it's open access, he can read that. And this is just one of many ways how you can demonstrate reuse. Just to give you a little overview of what PLOS is collecting, and we have started doing this in 2009, and for, for the user statistics, that goes back to 2003 when the PLOS started as a publisher. So this is user statistics, both from the PLOS website and from PubMed Central. This is citations from different sources, um, and this is social web activity, and of course list, this list is, uh, is, is growing. The last edition was Wikipedia two months ago. And of course, um, there are big differences in how often these you find things. Uh, obviously, every article will be downloaded at some point, so the, the lower, the dark blue, that's usage statistics. Citations depend very much on article age, so this is all 60 odd thousand plus articles published until November 8, and some of them were published just a week before or three months before, so if you look at articles that are two years old, you 80 or 90 percent of them are cited. And it's important we not, not just track numbers, but you, we look at actual citations. So you can go to the PLOS website and see who was citing this paper, and it's of course a service that you find in many other places. And for the social media, there's really a big variation. So Mendeley as a bookmarking tool used by scientists is the most highly used. Facebook and Twitter um, have, be have increased in use. So obviously, the paper was published in 2003. There was no Twitter, and I'm not sure whether there was Facebook. And um, comments on the journal website, science blog posts, these things are unfortunately not as popular as we would like, and that's true for other publishers as well. So scientists have difficulties or don't really go to places and comment on papers. Um, this is just a preliminary analysis. Um, by looking at papers that um, that are of more general interest, so for example, a lot of medical topics published by PLOS, and then, then also more specific uh, papers that are really more interested for a small scientific community, you can really see different usage patterns, and you can use this to demonstrate different kinds of reuse. So for example, scholars typically cite papers, they use Mendeley, they go to PubMed Central, which is a discipline-specific repository, they download a paper, whereas the casual user that just wants to learn something about a disease or something that's just of 
general interest in science may just go to the website, um, look at the web page, use Facebook or Twitter, and with these different metrics, you can demonstrate different kinds of users. And um, it's important that you don't fall in the trap that we have fallen a um, long time ago and still don't get out that you try to make your job easier by just looking at journals. So to say this paper was published in that journal and be, that's therefore it has this impact factor and therefore it's more important than this other paper. Um, and that's true for all the other metrics as well. So this is just showing the number of Scopus citations for all plus one papers published in 2009 and you see that this is a very wide variation and about 10% of them have been cited at least 29 times and there are other papers that have not been cited at all. So to say this paper was published in a specific journal in 2009 doesn't really tell you anything about the impact, you really have to look at the article level. Most of these metrics are really found in one place, so whether it's citations, maybe they're collected by different services, but that's sort of universal, or whether it's a specific service like Wikipedia or Mendeley, but user stats, of course, um, are collected in different places. And I have placed a question mark for the institutional repositories because for PLOS papers, we just don't know um, what is the percentage of people that, for example, download a PDF of a PLOS paper, what's the percentage of people that go to the PLOS website, that go to PubMed Central as a discipline-specific repository, and I should mention that, of course, uh, PubMed Central Europe has the same full-text content, and how much is really read in institutional repositories. Now, you can see that the PLOS website is the place where most users go, um, and it would be really interesting to understand whether the percentage, I mean, both what's, what's the number of use via institutional repositories and also what are the factors that are relevant. So, of course, whether the paper is open access or not, whether it's a specific subject area and many other factors. But for PLOS articles, we, we don't really know. Um, it's important that all these metrics are openly available. So this is not just open access articles, but the metrics are open data that everybody can use. And the tools to use these metrics, they're also open. So for example, all the visualizations we did, um, we used with, with a statistical and visualization language called R, and the tools of we used are openly available. So you can do your own analysis or do analysis of, of similar content from other places. And uh, this is my last slide to sort of think about um, how you can use this information to implement uh, as a service. And of course, um, partners in the Open Air Project have harvested user stats from different repositories, have aggregated this information, and have really worked out standards for collecting user stats and how to work together, etc. But user stats is really just a small part of, of what you can um, find in terms of reuse about an article and you really want to look at other things from citations to social media. And the sort of easiest way to do this is of course to do this for articles where this information is available. So this includes a number of publishers now and this list is sort of increasing every year. Um, but right now this is not really standardized, so it's different data formats from every source and you will have many holes in the information, so there are many publishers where you don't get this information yet. So another possibility would be to go to one of the emergent service providers that uh, provide this information across publishers and across disciplines. Um, but we don't want to fall in the trap to just build a commercial service model similar to citation databases. I mean, it should be open and freely available. Um, so another strategy would be to build a service 
which is probably more centralized than collecting user stats from many different places. And one starting point would be to use the software from PLOS or Impact Stories and other service. Uh, and we both provide our software as open source that other people can use. And the last slide is, I'm of course aware that this is the sort of start of Open Air Plus, and there's more things than journal articles. I mean, Plus is really a publisher of journal articles, but of course there's all kinds of content, especially data, but also other research outputs like software and presentation, etc. And of course you can also track all these things, and um, people have started to do that using basically the same tools. Um, data um, has, of course, a bigger challenge in that it's uh, Persistent identifiers for data are sort of emergent, and I see Jan Brase there from DataSite. And this example here is from Dryad, which uses DataSite DYs. But for many data, they are, they are just um, local identifiers or many different identifiers, so it's more difficult to track reuse of data. Um, and of course, reuse of data is not as common as reuse of publications. So for example, in this example, you see that the numbers are just much lower. So this is just at the beginning, but it's possible to do this, and I think um, it's a chicken and egg situation when you can track reuse, and I think it's important to think beyond data citation and also think about uh, usage and, and other reuses, that this will, of course, encourage more researchers to um, publish their data. Thank you very much.